There have been many wars in the world, and in almost all the major wars, the United States has played a crucial role. This led to the sacrifice of a large number of U.S. soldiers. But the war that saw the maximum number of U.S. nationals losing their lives was the U.S. Civil War. In this war of 1861, the lives that were lost were more than the total of all the lives lost in all the other wars fought by the U.S. The war that lasted for a total of four years fought for freedom. This war was between two parts of the country. The northern and the southern states fought for what they thought was right. The tension was brewing for a very long time because of the issues pertaining to the rights of the state and those of the federal authority. But when Abraham Lincoln became the 16th President of America on March 4, 1861, seven states of the South declared that they were opting out of the United States to form another country by the name of Confederate States of America. Just after a few days' time, Another four states joined in with the Confederate states, and this ignited the fire of war between the northern and the southern states. This war made many people who were closely related enemies of each other, leading to the largest killing in the history of the U.S. By the end of the war in 1865, the blood of as many as 620,000 soldiers was shed. Millions of other soldiers got injured, and the southern states and their economy were just devastated. Lincoln was a profound orator and a great politician. During the Civil War, he created a situation that pitted his opponents against each other. The Background of the Civil War The United States was the first country that experienced the economic push by the Industrial Revolution. But this push was just being experienced in the northern part of the country. The southern states were still facing the same problems and were still highly dependent on agriculture for their livelihood. The whole economy of the southern states of the United States was mainly dependent on cotton and tobacco production. The main problem was that the northern states wanted the abolition of slavery, while the southern states were against the abolition because the agricultural work could not be carried out without the help of cheap labor, or for that matter free labor in the form of slaves. The abolition of slavery was the final nail in the coffin of the economy of the southern states. The story begins with the U.S. Congress passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This act made slavery a legal thing in all the new territories of the western United States. This was, however, received with a lot of bloody fights between the supporters of the act and the opponents of the act in Kansas. This gave Kansas the name of Bleeding Kansas. The opponents of the act formed the Republican Party, which was a new political force working actively against the extension of slavery in the newly formed Western territories. Many events that proved that the abolitionists were bent on pushing slavery out of their boundaries convinced the southern states that the northerners will soon get their economy in real danger. The winning of the Republican Party that was formed by the abolitionists and election of Abraham Lincoln as the President of the United States of America was the final ring of danger to those who favored slavery. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. Abraham Lincoln It was at this time that seven of the southern states decided to secede from the Union of the States, called as the United States of America. These states were South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas. This was even before Lincoln took the oath as the 16th President of the U.S., at this time, the seceded Union that was called the Confederate States of America had laid a siege around Fort Sumter of Charleston in South Carolina. It was on the 12th of April, 1861, that a fleet was ordered by President Lincoln to resupply the fort, and it is on this day that the Confederates fired the first shot of what was later called the U.S. Civil War. Soon the commander of the fort, Major Robert Anderson, surrendered and the fort was captured by the forces of the Confederate States of America. When the other states saw that the Confederate forces are winning, they too joined in. There were four states that joined in after the capturing of Fort Sumter, and they were Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee. There were four other states too that were just being a spectator of the events, but were inhabited by the sympathizers of the slave states of South, and they were Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland. 
But in these states, where there were sympathizers for the Confederation, there were also people who were pro-Union, and this made the secession of these states into the Confederation an unfulfilled dream. Even a part of Virginia broke away from it and joined the Union of the states who were against slavery. This part of Virginia was called West Virginia. At the time of U.S. Civil War, there were 34 U.S. states. Out of those 34 states, 19 states were in favor of the abolition of the slavery, while 15 states were in favor of slavery in the name of their economy. Since four states did not declare secession, it became a battle that was lopsided. It is so because the industrialization that was dominant in the North states brought with it the technology that could produce arms and ammunition in large quantities without taking much time, while the Southern states that had their economy based mainly on the agricultural produce could not compete with this kind of industrial manufacturing of weapons. But the fact that the Southern states had a well-maintained and well-organized army was enough to bring the balance between the two sides. There were commanders and soldiers who were highly efficient and could win the battles just by applying unique strategies. It was not expected by the border states as well as the southern states that Abraham Lincoln would send troops to south, but it did happen, and the First Battle of Bull Run, or what is known in the south as First Manassas, started on 21st of July, 1861. The Confederate Army consisted of 35,000 soldiers and was led by Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. This army, due to the efficient leadership of Stonewall, was able to fight the forces from Washington, D.C. to retreat. This proved that the Union will not get the abolition of slavery easily. After this retreat, Lincoln became more alert and called for 500,000 recruits. Now, both sides realized that this is not going to be a small battle. Rather, it is going to last longer than they had initially expected. And this is why both the sides started recruiting more and more soldiers in their troops. The states that seceded contributed with their armies to the Confederation, while the states that were in the Union did the same for the Union troops. The border states of Virginia, Kentucky, and Missouri had governments that were both pro-Confederate and pro-Union. This is why they sent their armies in support of both sides. The northwestern portion of Virginia was occupied by the Union Army. This portion of Virginia declared itself separate from Virginia and was called as West Virginia. This separation took place in 1862-63, and Lincoln wasted no time in recognizing the state and its government as legal. Even the slave states of South contributed their armies for both the sides fighting the U.S. Civil War. It was only South Carolina that did not send its battalion in this manner. However, the pro-Union people from South Carolina fought in small units for different Union states. It was not only the governments that were divided on this issue and fighting with each other over it, but also the neighbors and the members of the same family were pitted against each other in this war. The number of soldiers in the Union Army was 170,000, while in the Confederate Army there were only 86,000 soldiers. The Reasons Behind the Civil War the reason that was the primary reason behind the start of the Civil War was secession. But the root cause of this secession was abolition of slavery. The northern states wanted to get the tradition of slavery abolished. They were mainly dependent on the industrial production for their survival and had no need of slaves. Moreover, more and more people saw it as inhumane and against the law of nature to capture another human being and enslave them. This thought was spreading fast and most of the northern states wanted to get slavery banned from the whole country. On the other hand, the southern states were mainly based on agricultural economy. They produced cotton and tobacco, for which there was always a requirement of labor. Slaves gave them cheap labor. The southern states did not want to leave the age-old tradition of enslaving people of different ethnicity and origin. Though many of the Confederate leaders started saying that they had seceded to protect the rights of the states, but before the war even started, many influential and top-ranked leaders had stated that the reason behind secession was slavery. Everyone must understand that, whatever be the evil of slavery, it is not increased by its diffusion. Everyone familiar with it knows that it is in proportion to its sparseness that it becomes less objectionable. Wherever there is an immediate connection between the master and slave, 
Whatever there is of harshness in the system is diminished. Jefferson Davis But after the war, the same people started talking in a different tone and refuted their previous comments, adding that they had fought that war for the rights of the states. We are not fighting for slavery. We are fighting for independence, and that or extermination we will have. Jefferson Davis Jefferson Davis was also spotted saying that all black people are not fit to govern themselves and that they should be treated in a manner similar to the lunatics, criminals, and children. It was only the abolitionists that were fighting for the rights of the states because from start till the end, they have always been spotted insisting on the federal rights and the human rights. Lincoln said, My paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause. And I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. The Combat Methods Used During the War The fight between the two sides was not only happening in the manner of the formal combat, instead there were many forms being used during this civil war. In the border region, there were many guerrilla fights happening. The attackers would just appear from nowhere at the time when the opponents would be carefree and slay their enemies before they could even become alerted. Apart from this, there happened many raids that were violent in nature along with feuds and major assassinations. Eastern Kentucky and Western Missouri were two regions that saw the maximum bloodshed during this war. The Massacre of Kansas is the most violent episode of the war. In this event of 1863, all innocent civilian men and boys were massacred brutally. There were 150 men and boys that were killed in this massacre. This event led the men of Kansas who were pro-Union to raid Missouri, but this raid was not of the same strength. The Importance of Border States The border states were so called because they were, first of all, a mixture of both Confederate ideology and the modernization of the northern states. The second reason that they were called as the border states is that these states were political, geographically, and economically connected to both sides of the country. Even in the present scenario, these states are considered to be the transitional states between North and South. It was only because of these connections that the border states did not secede from the Union. This decision, however, got rewarded as the Union Congress did not order for the reconstruction of these border states, and they were allowed to keep their rules and regulations intact. But they did undergo a change after the complete abolition of slavery in the U.S. through the passage of amendments and granting of citizenship and the voting rights of the men who were freed thereafter. Lincoln said, I think slavery is wrong morally and politically. I desire that it should be no further spread in these United States and I should not object if it should gradually terminate in the whole Union. The War in Virginia The Civil War in Virginia started in the year 1862, and in the beginning the supreme commander of the Union Army was Winfield Scott. He was an old fellow and showed reluctance over a long period of time from moving the troops ahead. The then President Abraham Lincoln got frustrated with this reluctance of an able commander who was loved by his army and replaced him in the year 1862. Winfield Scott was replaced by George B. McClellan, who was an able leader. McClellan had Army of the Potomac under his command, and he led this army to capture Yorktown on the 4th of May, 1862. This victory was, however, short-lived, as Robert E. Lee and Jackson, together with their combined armed forces, forced the Army of McClellan to retreat from Yorktown in the Seven Days Battle that was from June 5th to July 1st. When McClellan asked for reinforcement to proceed against Richmond, Lincoln instead called the Army of Potomac back. McClellan remained the commander of the Army of Potomac, but he was replaced by Henry W. Halleck as Union General-in-Chief. On the other hand, Robert E. Lee and Jackson 
were moving further towards north. He split his men into two groups and sent Jackson to engage with the forces of Pope somewhere about Manassas. Lee chose to proceed with the other portion of the army. A union that can only be maintained by swords and bayonets, and in which strife and civil war are to take the place of brotherly love and kindness, has no charm for me. Robert E. Lee Jackson had met with the forces of John Pope on August 29th, and that battle is known by the name of the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Second Manassas. Just the next day in the battle again the Union forces suffered a major setback, and the men of Pope were driven toward Washington by Lee, who attacked the forces from the Federal left flank. This attack was massive, and Pope's men had to retreat. This place, however, became the turning point of the war, as McClellan, who was able to get his men back, and even though the orders from Lincoln did not allow him to, but he did hit Lee's forces on the 14th of September in Maryland. This was highly unexpected, and the Confederate forces had to retreat toward Antietam Creek, which lies near Sharpsburg. This army of Potomac again hit Lee on September 17th. This time, Lee was not alone and had the reinforcement of Jackson's army. This day is considered to be the day when most lives were lost in a single day. The Union side had in total 69,000 troops, and they lost 12,410 soldiers in the battle, while the Confederate side, that had a total of 52,000 troops, lost as many as 13,724 soldiers. This victory at the Antietam Creek proved to be the major turning point because it not only stopped the Confederates in Maryland, but also forced them to retreat to Virginia. If McClellan could continue the winning streak, he would have remained the commander of the Army of Potomac. But since he failed to do so, Lincoln and Halleck decided to replace him with Ambrose E. Burnside. This again did not turn out to be a fruitful decision, and the attack by Burnside on the troops of Lee proved to be a failure near Fredericksburg on the 13th of December. During this battle, the Union forces had to suffer a lot of loss in the form of lives of the soldiers. Lincoln wasted no time and replaced Burnside with Fighting Joe Hooker. The Emancipation Proclamation When Lincoln saw that the Union army had achieved a great victory in Antietam Creek, then he decided that it was the best time to issue a proclamation that is known by the name of Emancipation Proclamation. According to the proclamation, all the slaves were to become freed men, with effect from January 1st, 1863. Lincoln, as he said, took this step as a measure that he should have taken during the war, but this had a huge impact on the Confederates, and they lost most of their labor forces. Around 186,000 African American soldiers joined the Union Army by 1865, and out of all those who joined during that time, 38,000 had lost their lives in various battles. The Emancipation Proclamation, however, was not applicable to the border states that had restrained themselves from seceding and joining the Confederates. This was justified again as a wartime measure by Lincoln. I believe the declaration that all men are created equal is the great fundamental principle upon which our free institutions rest. That Negro slavery is violative of that principle, but that, by our frame of government, that principle has not been made one of legal obligation, that by our frame of government, the states which have slavery are to retain it or surrender it at their own pleasure, and that all others, individuals, free states, and national government, are constitutionally bound to leave them alone about it. I believe our government was thus framed because of the necessity springing from the actual presence of slavery when it was formed that such necessity does not exist in the territories where slavery is not present. Abraham Lincoln War Scenario After the Emancipation Proclamation Hooker, who was replaced when the other commanders of the Union Army were being so successful, also could not do much. On 1 May 1863, his plans of the attack were spoiled by the surprise counterattack by the forces of Robert E. Lee. This again proved to be a very bloody battle, as both sides suffered major casualties. The Union Army lost as many as 17,000 of their soldiers, that were almost a 15% of the whole force. The Confederates, however, suffered major losses, as they lost 13,000 men, 
who made up almost 22% of the Confederate troops. Lee was highly excited by this victory, and he tried to replicate the results in the June of the same year, again by attacking the forces of General George Meade. The Union forces under General Meade were attacked on the 1st of July near Gettysburg. The battle continued for three days, and the bloodiness of the battle can be understood by the fact that Lee suffered a total loss of 60% of his Confederate army. There was a scope of Meade counterattacking running Confederate army, but he failed to do so, and the Confederate forces were able to escape to Virginia. This was the last invasion that was made by the Confederate forces over Union forces. On the other hand, Ulysses S. Grant was able to register a victory in Mississippi by capturing Vicksburg. This was followed by the victory of the Confederates at Chickamauga Creek, Georgia. This time, Lincoln experimented with Grant, and he was given the command of the Federal Army that was reinforced by the two corps of the Army of Potomac. Grant proved to be a successful venture and registered a victory in Chattanooga by the end of November. Appointment of Ulysses S. Grant as the supreme commander of the Union armies was another major turning point in the history of Civil War of the U.S. Grant replaced Halleck. Grant, on his appointment, made William T. Sherman the controller in the West U.S., and he himself left for Washington to take the charge of the Army of Potomac. From Washington, Grant proceeded toward the northern part of Virginia, where Lee was with his troops. Grant suffered a lot of loss in the month of May, at the Battle of Wilderness, and also at Spotsylvania. The loss was no less at the Coal Harbor in June, and also at the key real center of Petersburg again in June. Grant, however, did not lose heart and laid a siege on Petersburg for a total of nine months. Oh, I am heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you always seem to think he is suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do. Ulysses S. Grant On the other hand, Sherman was strategically defeating the Confederate forces, as he took Atlanta following which the army of 60,000 Union troops marched to the sea. This march to the sea became famous, as it almost ruined Georgia on its way, and took Savannah in their control on the 21st day of December. The start of the next year saw the downfall of the Confederate Army as Sherman's army took over Columbia and Charleston of South Carolina by the middle of February. By the mid of April, Sherman was able to win North Carolina, Fayetteville, Bentonville, Goldsboro, and Raleigh. I hate newspaper men. They come into camp and pick up their camp rumors and print them as facts. I regard them as spies, which in truth they are. If I killed them all, there would be news from hell before breakfast. William T. Sherman The Confederate forces command came into the hands of Lee now, who was already exhausted by the siege laid down by the forces of Grant. Lee made a last attempt to resist the siege by attacking and capturing Fort Stedman on the 25th of March, 1865. Though Lee was able to register a win here, he was quickly counterattacked, and the victory was reversed. After this, Lee's forces had to leave Richmond on the night that lies between April 2nd and 3rd. The whole on the next week went in Grant and Meade pursuing Lee and his Confederate forces along the banks of the River Appomattox. When the Confederates exhausted all their escaping possibilities, they had to surrender. Lee surrendered to Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse on 9th of April, 1865. It was not before 10th of May, 1865, that the resistance to the freedom of all men fell when President of the Confederates Jefferson Davis was captured in Georgia while he was trying to flee. Killing of the President President Abraham Lincoln did not live to see the final victory of humanity over oppression, as he was shot dead at Ford's Theater in Washington by the actor at the theater who was also a Confederate sympathizer, John Wilkes Booth, on the 14th of April, 1865. This was a major setback for the country that witnessed a radical change under the dynamic leadership of Abraham Lincoln and was still in the process of change. He was the torchbearer of the change, and his dedication toward his country is vividly evident in the Gettysburg Address that the endorsement of his ideology on nationalism, equal rights, democracy, and republicanism. So plain that no one, high or low, ever does mistake it, 
except in a plainly selfish way. For although volume upon volume is written to prove slavery a very good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. Abraham Lincoln Role of Abraham Lincoln During the Civil War The most important thing for Abraham Lincoln was keeping the sovereignty of the center undeterred in all the situations. The southern states that were talking about the federal rights had to be taught the real meaning of democracy without breaking the country into small pieces. For this, Lincoln concentrated more on the military operations and political manipulations during the war. His primary goal was to reunite the United States of America and establish a common ideology that will be applicable to all. For this, there were certain measures that were stern but had to be taken, such as Suspension of habeas corpus The habeas corpus is the law that protected the person who was detained by the detainee by unlawful means. The detained person can appeal to the court and ask the court for intervention through a person who is officially authorized to take such applications. It then becomes dependent on the court to keep the detention of the detained. Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. This led to the smooth movement of the army through Maryland and ensured the continuous communication of the rest of the country with Washington. Diffusing the Trent Affair During 1861, an international incident took place that came to be known as the Trent Affair. This was an incident between the Great Britain and the U.S. The Confederates knew that unless Britain and France made an intervention, their efforts of making a separate country could not be successful. So, for this, they sent out two diplomats toward Great Britain. These diplomats, however, were captured by the United States Navy from a British ship. This incident was protested strongly by the Great Britain. The situation became so bitter that it was feared that the two nations could engage in a war, or at least a diplomatic conflict. This arrest of the two diplomats was made by Union Captain Charles Wilkes. The citizens of the U.S. received this news with joy because they saw the sending of the diplomats as an infringement of the neutral rights and as an insult to the honor of the nation. But at this time, when civil war was unavoidable, the U.S. did not want to engage in a war with the Great Britain. And so, after a few weeks of long and tense discussions, Lincoln decided to let go of the envoy to Britain. The actions of Captain Wilkes were disavowed by the state without any type of formal apology to the offended nations. After this, the two diplomats resumed their journey, but could not garner any recognition from those countries. The Right Selection of the Top Generals It was not only the outcome of the war that was monitored by Abraham Lincoln, but he also supervised and kept a keen eye on all the efforts of war being made by different generals of the Union Army. Lincoln made quick and effective decisions of replacing the top generals, and, when they started failing in their efforts and losing one area after another to the Army of the Confederates, he only let Ulysses S. Grant till the end of the war because of his continuous victories over the enemy. Abraham Lincoln not only monitored the land, but also the sea during the U.S. Civil War. He made the important decision of blocking the trade between the southern states and the rest of the world. He decided to take control of Kentucky and Tennessee. He used the gunboats and took under his control the river system of the southern states. The capital of the Confederates was in Richmond, and Abraham Lincoln desperately wanted to capture Richmond. He kept changing the generals who failed in their attempts to capture this capital of the Confederates till Lincoln found Ulysses S. Grant, who finally brought the U.S. Civil War to an end by getting rid of all the anti-abolitionists. Choosing the Right Time for Emancipation Proclamation Declaration As soon as the Union Army registered a win at Antietam Creek, Lincoln decided to declare the Emancipation Proclamation to give the much-anticipated freedom to all the slaves in the states that were under the control of the Union. He also made a clever decision of leaving out the border states that had not seceded. This led the enslaved African-American people to join the Union Army in very large numbers. This not only increased the strength of the Union Army, but also the belief of the people in Washington, D.C. Lincoln said in his fourth message to Congress in December 1864, I repeat the declaration made a year ago, that while I remain in my present position, 
I shall not attempt to retract or modify the Emancipation Proclamation, nor shall I return to slavery any person who is free by the terms of that proclamation, or by any of the acts of Congress. If the people should, by whatever mode or means, make it an executive duty to re-enslave such persons, another, and not I, must be their instrument to perform it. By the end of the war in 1865, the blood of as many as 620,000 soldiers was shed. Millions of other soldiers got injured, and the southern states and their economy were just devastated. Lincoln was a profound orator and a great politician. During the Civil War, he created a situation that pitted his opponents against each other. The Background of the Civil War the United States was the first country that experienced the economic push by the Industrial Revolution. But this push was just being experienced in the northern part of the country. The southern states were still facing the same problems and were still highly dependent on agriculture for their livelihood of the act and the opponents of the act in Kansas. This gave Kansas the name of Bleeding Kansas. The opponents of the act formed the Republican Party which was a new political force working actively against the extension of slavery in the newly formed Western territories. Many events that proved that the abolitionists were bent on pushing slavery out of their boundaries convinced the southern states that the northerners will soon get their economy in real danger. The winning of the Republican Party that was formed by the abolitionists and election of Abraham Lincoln as the President of the United States of America was the final ring of danger to those who favored slavery. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it. There have been many wars in the world, and in almost all the major wars, the United States has played a crucial role. This led to the sacrifice of a large number of U.S. soldiers. But the war that saw the maximum number of U.S. nationals losing their lives was the U.S. Civil War. In this war of 1861, the lives that were lost were more than the total of all the lives lost in all the other wars fought by the U.S. The war that lasted for a total of four years fought for freedom. This war was between two parts of the country, the northern and the southern. The whole economy of the southern states of the United States was mainly dependent on cotton and tobacco production. The main problem was that the northern states wanted the abolition of slavery, while the southern states were against the abolition because the agricultural work could not be carried out without the help of cheap labor, or for that matter, free labor in the form of slaves. The abolition of slavery was the final nail in the coffin of the economy of the southern states. The story begins with the U.S. Congress passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act, this act made slavery a legal thing in all the new territories of the western United States. This was, however, received with a lot of bloody fights between the supporters of southern states fought for what they thought was right. The tension was brewing for a very long time because of the issues pertaining to the rights of the state and those of the federal authority. But when Abraham Lincoln became the 16th President of America on March 4, 1861, seven states of the South declared that they were opting out of the United States to form another country by the name of Confederate States of America. Just after a few days' time, another four states joined in with the Confederate States, and this ignited the fire of war between the northern and the southern states. This war made many people who were closely related enemies of each other, leading to the largest killing in the history of the U.S.